Hi there, uh, welcome to the first of our talks about evolution. Uh, in this particular presentation, we're going to be focusing on the main uh, evidence for the theory of evolution by natural selection, and in particular the work of uh, Charles Darwin and a chap called Alfred Russell Wallace. Uh, and we might touch on uh, some ideas of adaptation as well. So Charles Darwin, most of you are familiar with the name already. He's the man who is credited with the theory of evolution, but actually there were two people who were important in the contributions. Uh, Darwin and Wallace both proposed a theory of uh, natural selection. Evolution was not uh, really just Darwin's theory alone. He was one of the people, however, who collected lots of evidence to support the theory and published a paper to show that the theory uh, was a viable theory. So they both thought about common ancestry and these idea that changes could be passed on from one generation to the next as organisms change to suit their environment. Now, where did Darwin get his ideas? Well, mostly from uh, setting up on a journey. Um, he was a ship's naturalist. Note, naturalist, collecting information about natural organisms rather than naturist, somebody who likes parading around in the nude. Uh, naturalists, um, he collected evidence, he looked up uh, different organisms from his journey around the world. Um, in particular, the Galapagos Islands off the coast of South America was one of the places he was interested in. Uh, but it was a long journey, five years. But notice, it's even though that journey was five years, it still finished in 1836. It took him at least 20 years to publish his findings. He wanted to be sure, particularly because he thought his theories were controversial and didn't chime with the uh, religious ideas of the day. Uh, so 1859 was when he actually published, and it he saw it as his life's work. Um, and it outlined the theory of evolution and some of the ideas, natural selection. And he didn't really use the term himself, survival of the fittest, but it was coined by another scientist and rapidly taken up as something that was part of it. So one of his key pieces of evidence, the idea of these different finches, the finches from the Galapagos Islands, and in particular, their beaks and what they look like. Now, naturalists used to collect specimens. So Darwin came back with a variety of stuffed specimens of finches, which he uh, collected and killed to demonstrate his th th findings. I've seen them at the Natural History Museum, uh, so they uh, still exist. Um, and his theory was that the, these finches arrived from the mainland, from uh, South America, and were blown, a, a population or a group of them were blown by wind to the Galapagos Islands, where they then took up um, space in what we call a niche in other words, a particular place of where they could feed and a habitat so that they uh, filled that particular area. Now, depending on which island they landed on, they began to gradually change to suit the environment. Remember, it's not that they are changing. It's that those with the best characteristics survive to breed to pass on that characteristic to the next generation. Uh, and eventually you get rapidly appearing different species. So you have a range from... Um, ones with sort of parrot-like beaks for eating fruit, uh, pointy beaks for picking at insects. This one actually uses cactus spines to wiggle out insects, and then these with bigger, heavier beaks for crushing seeds, adapted to suit the conditions on the islands in which they're found. So the idea that there's natural variation in beak shape due to differences, different alleles, for example, yeah, coding for beak shape. Due to the differences in the environment, for example, different foods available on different islands, um, there's a, what we call a selection. In other words, some organisms survive because they find food and others don't. The successful individuals then survive long enough to breed and pass on the genes, producing young, which also have the same beak, that particular beak type that allows them to survive. And over a period of time, this results in what we call speciation, the formation of a separate species. Uh, this just drops through a simple, similar, same thing again. Um, you've got variation causing alleles, possibly by mutation, competition for resources, the idea that there can be competition, that there are too many organisms to survive. You, know, you might have large numbers of offspring uh, and only some of those will survive. So those characteristics get passed on and more of those individuals get passed on with successful characteristics. Those less well adapted die out leaving only the fittest to survive. 
And the idea that some of these things um, that arise are what we call endemic. In other words, they're unique to that particular environment. They're not found anywhere else. And that's it could be as much as about plant species as animal species. Uh, things could be blown there on the wind or carried there on the waves. And then over a long period of time, they gradually change to suit the environment. And then other organisms which feed on those adapt to feed on that particular unique thing. So the separation by uh, often an island because it's uh, you get separation by the sea, but it could be a large mountain range, something that provides a barrier that prevents organisms from crossing it means that you get a new and unique environment produced. So Darwin's key observations to contribute towards this were offspring appear similar to their parents, but not identical. The organisms produce large numbers of offspring, much larger than they would actually need to just replace the two uh, parents. Yeah, so two parents produce much bigger numbers of offspring than they actually need to to replace the two that there were. And also populations, unless there is a sudden change in the environment, remain stable in size. They don't fluctuate wildly in large numbers. So therefore, these were some of his ideas that contributed to the theory of natural selection. OK, what else did he use as part of his evidence at Darwin from 1858 so that he could he looked at artificial selection um, in dogs and pigeons and cows. So he could see that you could get a dramatic change by breeding the best with the best over a short period of time and actually artificially exaggerate a particular characteristic. So in other words, showing that evolution occurs, even though it's been co completed by man. The idea of comparative anatomy, this idea of the pentadactyl limb that has similar characteristics. So in lizards and humans and birds and this extinct organism, uh, they all have a comparative um, sort of limb shapes and limb layouts. So you've got the bones which form in similar places. Fossil evidence, the idea that there are missing links. Fossils were just beginning to be uh, sort of popularized at that particular time. So he started to use the idea that fossil um, is, could also contribute to the evidence of how organisms have changed over time. And obviously his idea of living species. What do we use now? Well, molecular evidence, DNA and RNA is, is universal to everything. Uh, ATP is universal to everything. Same amino acids are universal to everything. Everything has a phospholipid membrane and the other sort of biochemical pathways are fairly similar in most organisms. Obviously there are differences, but that overall it's suggesting a shared origin of life from original common ancestor. Genomics is this study of the genome, the sequence of all of the bases uh, in particular order. So how do those base pairs in sequence make up the genome of an organism and how do these sort of sequences com uh, code for proteins? Um, now if a particular protein is coded for, like haemoglobin, um, that in a particular sequence the amino acid is obviously laid out in the same sequence and if there are slight differences which uh, between organisms then that shows you how closely related they are, this idea back to phylo phylogenetics. Um, and for primates, for example, yeah, the similarity, the more similarities there are between an organism, the fewer differences there are for human hemoglobin. So um, if you, you can make a phylogenetic tree. So humans uh, and chimpanzees are most closely related. So they will be the last and final branch. So uh, if you have put the data in, yeah, humans and chimpanzees are most closely related, uh, gorillas next most related um, then you've got the gibbon which is going to be the next branch and so on you go further and further back till you go to the next common ancestor and the next common ancestor and so on. so um, let's look at a short exercise here um, here we've got some uh, different stages of natural selection but at the moment they're jumbled up so you need to see if you can work out before the next video which order these things belong in okay see you soon bye, -bye.